most of us here, since the moment when we trusted Christ as our personal Savior, have the desire in our heart to share the gospel with the people around us. And we have the privilege and the responsibility to do that. Since that moment, and when somebody comes to know Christ as his personal Savior, has that desire to do it right away, as he can, with the knowledge that he has, with the capacity that he has at that moment. But he has the, what the Holy Spirit is putting in his heart to share about Christ. And all of us experience that in a certain moment. And some of us kept that. And we encourage, I would like to encourage you through the things that we will see this morning to revive that uh, prompting of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of each one of us to be bold witnesses for him in the places where God has put us. Knowing that telling the gospel to the people around us is not just an option. It's not just a good thing to do. It's what we were sent to do. Is a responsibility and a privilege that we receive, each one of us, that met Christ as our personal Savior. In the passage that we've seen together, we've seen a room with the disciples, with ten disciples, a closed room, a locked room. There are ten disciples discouraged, sitting one next to each other. And when somebody looks to them, to this situation, he would not give too much on these guys. They kind of are worth nothing. They are demoralized, disillusioned, with memory gaps, and evidently without any perspectives for the future. But suddenly somebody appears in their midst. And the person that appears is the risen Christ. And this risen Christ appears in their midst and transforms the moment, transforms the very critical situation for these people. He came without opening the doors because the doors were locked because of the fear of the Jewish people. The, he came without opening the, door, the, the doors, stood in their midst, and the first thing he tells them is, peace be with you. Peace be with you. They were really troubled, disoriented, scared, just like in John 14, when he says, don't let your heart be troubled. In this moment, their heart was troubled. But the reason Christ has changed the things for these people, the Lord came close to them, showed them his hands, his side. And the Bible says that these people, when they saw the Lord, they were overjoyed. They were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Things have changed completely when they met the risen Christ. And he tells them the second time, peace be with you. And he tells, tells them something else. He tells them, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. A commission that transformed that special moment for these people. Special moment for the disciples in that moment, in that time. Now we ask ourselves, what would be missing so that the same thing that happened with the disciples in that time would happen with us in this morning, right here, just as we are? What is missing so that the same thing would happen? They would met, we'd meet this morning, the risen Christ. And some of the people around, probably some of the people that have a negative uh, attitude would say, well, that's not possible anymore. Things change a lot. People think differently. It's not possible anymore to happen to, to experience things like this. People became very materialistic. They don't want to know anything about God. Their heart is hardened. They left God aside and don't want anything to know about God. Anything with what is spiritual. They don't want to know anything about that. Today, things are totally different. Well, if that is the case with us, and this is what we think this morning, the best thing to do is to follow the example of the disciples. We take a lock, we put it at the door, we close the door very well, the windows and everything, and we stay here and we enjoy the salvation that we received through Jesus Christ. And we wait here. If there is nothing to do, it's better to wait here and enjoy the songs, enjoy the word of God, enjoy the fellowship. Happy with the salvation that we received. We put a lock at the door and everything is finished.
What we ask ourselves today, what is missing so that the fire of the gospel would be lit once again and burned to maximum with people like us and be able to put this world on fire with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What would be, what would be missing? I believe that if the same thing that happened with the disciples is about to happen with each one of us, we need to meet the risen Christ. The Lord said that where there are two or three gathered in my name, I am there in, I'm, I'm there in their midst. And I would like to do something today by faith to get to meet the risen Christ and to listen to his word and to his voice, to his commandment once again. Because hearing his voice, hearing his commandment, getting him close to our heart this morning changes the things, changes the perspective. And I would like to make an invitation this morning to each one of you. By means of our imagination, we'll go to Galilee because the Lord Jesus said, told the disciples that he wanted to meet with them in that place. So we'll go to Galilee to hear the Lord's voice very close to our heart, very close to each one of us. In the same way that he did with the disciples in that time. And I would like to see this morning three teachings about the Great Commission. The Great Commission that is not just for missionaries, for pastors, or for people that have certain gifts to do certain ministries, but for each one of us, individually, and for, each one, for all of us as an aggregate, in an aggregate form. I don't know what is the connection that you do with these disciples. I don't know what are the fears that are in your heart, in making know what God has done in your heart. I don't know what is keeping you in that prompting of the Holy Spirit to tell the gospel with the people around. But I pray that this morning God will speak to your heart and will take those fears and present himself to you and give you the great commission this morning. And if you have already heard that great commission for you, this morning to be a time of renewal of that call that God has for you. It's not a call for Emmanuel and Teresa to Greece. It's not a call for certain people. It's a call for absolutely each one of us here in this morning. First of all, I would like to talk about a specific setting. The Lord tells, uh, tells the disciples to go to Galilee because he wanted to meet with them there. I don't know why. Why did he, he didn't he meet with them in Jerusalem if he rose from the dead there in Jerusalem? No, go to Galilee because I want to meet with you there. And I want to go together with the disciples this morning and with 11 people to that place right now. It says that he will meet with them on a mountain, on a mountain. And I ask, we ask ourselves and ask you, which one of the mountains of Galilee is the one that he met, he wanted to meet with the disciples? I'm sure of one thing, even, even if I'm not dogmatic about this, but I'm pretty sure about what am I about to say. It's just a conclusion that I got to. According to my opinion, the mountain where the Lord Jesus wanted to meet with the disciples is the same mountain that we find in Mark chapter 3, where he called whom he wanted to teach them and prepare them to have them with him and to send them to preach. The, pe the place where Christ chose the 12 disciples, I think is the same mountain because I believe that what the Lord wanted to do, it was to renew, to start all over again what he did with them three years ago. And he said, go there. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 32, it says that he already uh, told the disciples in the uh, upper room before he died, he said, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. He had already foreseen this. He had already planned it, that he would go to meet the disciples in Galilee on a certain mountain. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 7, it says, Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And verse 10, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There you will see me. <coughs> Without any doubt, he wanted to start things all over again. Or to remind them what happened three years ago when he called them, from that place. There were 12, now there are 11. In my opinion, it's the same place. These were the, some of the last words and the most important, important word, words of the master for, the, for his disciples. One of his last appearances. 
generally is being taken into consideration when somebody is about to die or about to live or to live into eternity, the last words are taken into consideration in a very serious way. Each time his words are listened because they are very special, they have a special significance. And obviously, these were some of the last words of the Lord Jesus. And that's why they have a special significance. So today I invite each one of us to come close to the mountain, to the mountain, by faith and by means of our imagination, to listen to the last words of the Master, because the Lord has something very important to tell to the heart of each one of us this morning. Therefore, we'll read again one of the passages that we, we have seen already, but just to refresh our memory, it says in Matthew 28, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they, wo they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples from all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Maybe you have heard this many times, but this is a special day. When we look at the harvest, it is big and the workers are few. And I invite you to listen, to prepare your heart, to listen to the word, the commandment. The first thing we see is a specific setting. It is a mountain, the place where the Lord is going to meet with the disciples in order to renew the calling. And also is a mountain, the place where they receive the great commission. In the second place, we would like to see a special mission that these people receive. I would like to see a few words that we find in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, talking about the commandment with speci special meaning, different meanings. The first one of them, referring to a commandment, has to do with telling or to talking. Now, when we ask ourselves, who is the one that is speaking here? Who is the one that gi is giving the commandment? Because it is a specific person. Somebody could say, well, he's a carpenter from Nazareth that one day closed a carpentry in order to accomplish an extraordinary mission. He's the one that is speaking. He's the one that came to his own and his, one, his own did not receive him. He's the one that is speaking. He's a preacher from the Sea of Galilee that performed many miracles. He's the one that is speaking this morning. The one that came with well, three well-established purposes. He came to reveal the Father, to save the man, and to reign over Israel. And through his life he revealed, and through his death and res resurrection he saved. He couldn't reign, unfortunately, because of the man's unbelief. But he is, he is the one that is speaking. And he speaks to my heart and speaks to your heart. He doesn't have a lot of money. He doesn't have a human army to support him. He doesn't have political support. He's alone. But he made a big difference in the multitudes through his words, through his life through his miracles, through his message. But he's a simple man. He's a 100% man. But this morning, I want to tell you something very special. The one that is speaking is God made flesh, dwelling among us. He's a 100% man, but he's a 100% God. And the one that is speaking to your life, to give you a very special commandment this morning, is God. Now when God speaks, something happens. And this morning, we will speak, he will speak very close to your heart. These verses that we have seen together are very interesting. In verse 18, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So we have, he went near, near them to the group, and he spoke to them. God is the one that is speaking. So we should not limit to the carpenter from Nazareth. We should not limit to the Galilean that established his home in Capernaum. I want, to be, I want us to be aware that the one that speaks to our heart is God. The same way he spoke to the disciples in that moment. The second word that has to do with command is the word that has to do with Lord, Master, power. The one that is speaking here has authority. He's just 33 years old, but he has authority. He's not just anyone. We notice his authority in a few things. First of all, we notice his authority in his personal testimony. In verse 18, it says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The one thing that is speaking, the one that is speaking to our hearts this morning is the one that has authority over everything. 
He is almighty. Personal testimony. In John 17, in the priestly prayer, he says that my father gave me power to give eternal life. He has the power to give eternal life. Authority to do this. And then in the, in the upper room in John 13, Jesus, who knew that the Father has put all things under his power, all things under his power, and that he came from, the, from God and he was returning to God, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist and washed the disciples' feet. All authority. All authority because of personal testimony. But also, he has all authority because of the testimony of the word of God. In Colossians 1, 15, it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of our all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God has pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The one that is speaking surely has authority. Total authority to speak to each one of us this morning. But also, he proves his authority through his words and works. I like it when the Lord went into the temple and they transformed the temple into a marketplace and he took a whip and he turned over the tables of the people that transformed the temple in, in a marketplace. And the people were wondering, who is this one that is doing these things? With what authority? Not knowing that they are in the front of the God of the temple, the God the Savior, God the Creator. But also, what talks about the testimony of the one speaking is a testimony of people. I like the passage when the Roman centurion sends a group of people to Jesus. He had a servant that was sick, was dying. And he sent a group of people to ask Jesus to come to his home and heal the servant. And Jesus answers, and he wants to go to the, people, to the centurion's home and help. And the, centurion's home think, uh, the centurion thinks, well, wait a minute, Lord. I'm a centurion, and I have people under me, under my orders. And I tell one to go, and he goes. I tell one to come, and he comes. And I tell you something, Jesus. You just say a word, and my servant will be healed. And when the servant went back, the, the servant was healed exactly in that moment. And Jesus was surprised. And he said, I've never seen. He, this guy is not a Jewish, people, a Jewish guy. Sure enough, he knew about the authority of Jesus Christ. Say a word, and my servant will be healed. But also what, calls my, what catches the eye of my attention is the calling that Jesus made to the disciples. Follow me. Follow me. Just two words. And people were living F, F everything, and they were following the teacher. It's not just the carpenter from Nazareth. <coughs> it's God made flesh dwelling among us. Speaking to the heart of each one of us this morning, giving the great commission. Another meaning of the word command is order or decree. You know, when we learn, we learn something really interesting about the authority through this. Someone who is a master, someone who has the power, has authority, must be very clear in the orders that he's giving to the people around him. In this way, he demonstrates his, his authority, being very clear in the orders that he gives. In verse 19, the Lord says, Go therefore and make disciples from all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All these are imperative verbs. What he asks is not optional. It's just go and do. It's imperative. So those that were around the Lord in that time, they had very clear what they had to do. Uh, what is the commandment synthesizing? You must go and conquer the world. Conquer the world with passion, with power. That was very clear order of the master. The clear order of God. The one to ha that has authority. Go and preach the gospel. The order was fulfilled by the people in that age. In the world, known world in that time. They took the gospel to the end of the world. There were just a few. Far fewer than why we are here today. So we can take this challenge very easily. 
and trust the Lord for giving us the energy and the power to get the message of the gospel to the end of the world. We were far fewer than us. We cannot say we are too, not too many. Go and preach. Very clear. Where is the Lord leading you? What is the commandment? What is the leading of God for you? You cannot say, well, I do not know where the Lord is still leading me. Well, when God is calling you, he will show you where. There are so many works to be done. There are so many ministries to be accomplished. And when God is calling you, he will show you where. But secondly, it says, make disciples. And it's amazing to see the mission that he came when he came first, he has when he came first on this world is the same that he has today is to look for disciples. He is looking for men and women that will follow him closely, disciples of Jesus Christ. Today, he is also searching for the same thing. And certainly, he has his eyes on over this place in this morning, looking for disciples, people that will, look, will follow him closely. <coughs> and then it mentions about baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism speaks about identification. And he wants genuine, Christian, genuine Christians to identify with him and to send them to teach all things, the ministry of teaching. So the message is very clear. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them what the Father has commanded you. Now I want to, you to uh, observe something here. Here is authority, because what he told us to do, what he's sending us to do, he did it first. The Lord Jesus never sent us to do something that he didn't do it first. So what he asked us for us, he did it. And he has the same mission that he had then. He has it now to look for disciples, people that will follow him. There is another thing that, uh, another word that has to do with uh, commandment, and is the word messenger. The word that God is giving us to do is an honorable job. We were given an honorable job to go and preach the gospel, good tidings of salvation through Jesus Christ. That there is forgiveness through Jesus Christ. The commandment involves a messenger. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the message that we are, we are getting. It's a program in which the main feature is obedience. When he speaks to your life, he has all authority. He wants us to go and make, disciple, make disciples. But in the last in the last uh, part, I would like to mention something else. It's, it is a promising addition. It's not just a special place. What he takes us to the original place where he called us. And each one of us can remember, when did God call me? When did I receive the great commission to be a servant, to be a messenger of the Lord to the people around me? Not only that. Not only to renew the, 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 send the commission that he has for you. Not only the special mission that he has for you to make disciples. But also there is a promising addition. He ends this saying, I am with you always until the end of the age. The Lord said that to the disciples on that occasion and says to our life today, I will not leave you alone. I will come with you. I send you, but I come with you. We are running an advantage because the Lord is with us. I'm going, but I'm staying. Is the Jesus plus. In Joshua 1.5, the Lord tells to Joshua, no one can stand in your way all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord's plus. He sent us in Acts 1.8, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. His Holy Spirit is with us. He goes with us. And he goes with us. And in Hebrews chapter 13, he says, because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may, say bold, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. And this Lord of the ministry is coming with us. What can we say? We can say many things of the way that this God is coming with us. Many of the things that he is doing. I was mentioning in the Sunday school class about just people praying for a Bible and somebody just bringing a Bible in the same day. People at the moment to commit suicide. Somebody bringing a Bible, reading the Word of God. Divine appointments that God is preparing for the people that open their hearts to be used by Him. What, I, what have, am I going to say about the 
when Bibles were given, in, there was one village when the Bible, was, the Bible were, gi were given in that place. The priest comes with people to make a riot there and ch chase, away, uh, chase, chase us away from the village. And people, the priest started yelling at us. And there was another guy in our team that was involved in all kind of things. Human trafficking, uh, guns trafficking, and everything. So he started telling his testimony in the same time as the priest was talking. So about 20 minutes, they talked, both of them, in the same time. Until the moment when the priest just started crying. And he said, okay, I'm going to help you give these Bibles. <laughs> Only God knows what is in the heart of the people around us. So we should not be deceived by the uh, external appearances. By the fact that we, it seems that the people are not interested. In a miraculous way, one of the biggest, one of the biggest miracle is the miracle of salvation. But then one of the most uh, biggest miracles that we can see each time is the way he, got, he prepares the hearts of the people around us when we tell them the gospel. It's just miraculous. We have no idea what is God doing there. So I would like to encourage you this morning to get that commission refreshed for you this morning. And look back a little bit in the moment when God called you and refresh that call. And that take that commission of going and teaching the people how to live for the Lord and know that he is with you always until the end of the age. If there is people that never met Christ as their personal savior this morning also, I would like to encourage you to be today the day when you put your trust in risen Christ because he is the answer. It's not about how good we are. It's not about how well we can prepare ourselves for getting to be saved. It's how much we put our trust in the one that paid all for us to receive the free salvation, the free gift through Jesus Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ for each one of us. I encourage you, if you never put your trust in Christ, if you are, never, if you are not sure that your sins are forgiven, ask Christ to be your Savior just this morning. Just as you are, because he's ready to receive you. And present himself, himself as the risen Christ that is able to do a big difference, a transformation in your life as he did in the disciples' life and in the life of many people in my life. We pray that these things would be an encouragement and a blessing for each one of you and make of all of us bold witnesses to get the gospel to the people around us, trusting in the results that he can give us. He can give. Going over all the things that are against us in a time like this. People that might reject. People that might ridicule us. But they are not doing that to, towards us. They are doing towards the message of the gospel. But we have today, 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 the privilege of getting this message. Amen?